here in 2 Timothy 2.16. Now I want to look at some rules of Bible interpretation. The rules of Bible interpretation are also called hermeneutics, meaning the science of the interpretation of literature. While the rules of Bible interpretation are similar to those of literature in general, there are some significant differences resulting from the supernatural character of the Bible. And we do know that the Bible is a supernatural, amen? So yes, some are different, and we have to look at them. And that for now, I only want to look at some of the most important rules of Bible interpretation. So they will be fresh in our minds as we study the Bible, so we may understand a little bit better where we get confused. And there is some places where people get confused in the Bible. So we need to kind of know how to interpret. The first rule is context is all important in defining words and interpreting passages. So context is all important. I believe this with all my heart because my background, there were so many teachings that were taken out of one verse and it didn't include the context and then there was wrong teachings in there. It just wasn't the right teaching. Like one verse that says, stay with what you have learned. And they said, so you can't believe something else now than what your parents have taught you because the Bible teaches us we're supposed to stay with whatever we have learned. But they don't take the context. So they don't understand the whole teaching of it. But here, context is all important in defining words and interpreting passages. The first and foremost rule a Bible interpretation is to define its meaning according to context. Absolutely nothing is more important than this. We have to define its meaning according to context. And um, I want to look at uh, 2 Timothy here, and just for some examples. It is necessary, first off, we have to, it is necessary to know what the immediate book and chapter is about. The Bible is, self is a self-interpreting book if we allow the context to rule. The Bible will interpret itself, in other words, if we allow the context to rule at all times. And as Bible study, I think it's important that we know this. We need to know that the Bible is a self-interpreting book if we allow the context to rule. Now, let's consider the phrase where I read profane and vain babblings in uh, 2 Timothy 2.16. Let's consider this phrase, phrase. What does this mean? If we only read this verse, chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings. What does this mean? We need to ask ourselves this. Well, the very first thing to do is to look at the context. If we don't look at the context, we probably won't get the right understanding in this. And this is just a couple of examples I have here to look at how we can interpret the Bible correctly. And yes, allow the context to rule at all times here. Here, the very first thing, like I said, is to Look at the context. There, there we learn that profane and vain babblings are, let's see. Let's go to verse 15. It says, study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is he, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So here if we look at this context completely, we see that profane and vain babblings are those things that are contrary to the truth, are those things that are contrary 
to sound doctrine, in other words. Here we say, first of all, are contrary to those things that are, that is sound doctrine. So we avoid, in other words, profane and vain babblings. Shun profane and vain babblings, it says, for they will increase into more ungodliness. Second, those things that produce, those profane and vain babblings produce confusion and bad fruit. You know, for me, it's a little different here trying to explain this when I don't see that many people out here because most of you are watching online today, and I thank you for that, and God bless you for it. But here we need to understand, first of all, profane and vain babblings produce unsound doctrine. They're contrary to sound doctrine. They produce doctrine that is not the right doctrine according to what the rest of the Bible teaches. Secondly, they produce confusion and bad fruit according to verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So what do profane and vain babblings do? They increase unto more ungodliness. So if we have conversations with people, and you know, sometimes we do. There's a lot of times you have conversations with people that don't believe the same things you do. That would say, well, we interpret the Bible a little different than you do. And then, yes, there would be questions, and there would, would be profane and vain babblings. And you know, then we could always come to false doctrine, confusion, and bad fruit could, produce, could be produced because here it teaches us for they will increase unto more ungodliness. If we don't shun profane and vain babblings, we will increase into more ungodliness. And then three, we need to avoid or shun profane and vain babblings because they will be harmful to our Christian life. Profane and vain babblings can be harmful to our Christian life, will not allow us to grow spiritually, not allow us to grow spiritually. So what does this mean? First thing to do is look at the context, then we learn that profane and vain babblings are those things that are contrary to sound doctrine, those things that produce confusion and bad fruit, verse 16, and those things that are harmful to Christian life, verse 17. So this is one way to be able to interpret the Bible, allowing the context to rule. Allowing the context to rule. And I want to go to Titus a little bit as well. Titus verse, chapter 3, verse 9. The next book there in Titus chapter 3, verse 9. It says, but avoid foolish questions. Same thing again. Now let's consider the phrase foolish questions. What does this mean or what is this? Again, the context defines the phrase. Foolish questions are questions, if we read verse 8, that claim that good works are not important. Let's read verse 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable, profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strifings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Again, if we take the context and allow the context to rule, we see well, these foolish questions claim that good works are not important, in verse 8. And verse 9, we see they produce strife. And also in verse 9, we see that they misuse the law. And also, we see in verse 9 that they are unprofitable. They are unprofitable. So foolish questions are not profitable for believers. And 
Last, they are used by false teachers in verse 10, we see as well. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. So yes, just avoid foolish questions. Shun profane and vain babblings because they are not profitable to us. They bring confusion and bad fruit. That's what these verses here mean. And uh, now let's consider the phrase in 2 Peter. Now I'm going to go to the book of 2 Peter here a little bit as well. And uh, 2 Peter, if you have your Bibles with you, could you please go there in chapter 3. I think it was chapter 1, sorry. 2 Peter chapter 1. And I'm going to go to verse 20. It says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Now let's consider this phrase. That no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. This has been interpreted in several, several different ways. But the meaning is clearly given in the next verse. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So here again, if we let, allow the context to rule, we see exactly what this means. We see, see exactly what this means, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. We see that it means that the human authors of the Bible did not invent the words that they wrote, but that they wrote what the Holy Spirit had given them. We see this in verse 21. So yes, it's not the human men. I had a man once tell me, and he has passed away, and I don't know if he was saved or not before he, he passed, but he came up to me, and he always had a lot of questions on the Bible. And he used to say, how can you believe that the Bible is true? Could anybody believe that a man could be swallowed of a whale, live three days in a whale's stomach, and then be spewed out and still live? He says, how can anyone believe that? That is impossible. Can anybody believe that there is one God and three persons, he said. How do you explain that? So he had a lot of, a lot of questions and a lot of, he wanted to talk about the Bible a lot. And he says, and how can you believe that God is a just God when you read the Old Testament and you hear all the wars that went on and God allowed them to happen? So yes, there is a lot of foolish questions out there. But people that don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they will never understand the Bible correctly. And they need to accept Christ before they will understand. But here we see that yes, if we allow context, the context to rule, we can interpret the Bible the right way. Yes, and the next thing and where I wanted to go with this, he said, and who wrote the Bible? It was men that wrote the Bible. So how can you depend upon what men say when men change their minds all the time? Because the Bible says men wrote the Bible. And at the, here we see uh, clearly in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says, knowing this first, that no prophecy, prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. These men, they were told what to write. And that's what verse 21 teaches us. If we uh, allow the context to rule, we see that God told these men exactly what they should write, letter for letter. So yes, when we see the context, we see that the men didn't write out of their own wisdom. And then we can interpret it the correct way. But we're moved by God. And God used them in a mighty way. In a mighty way. Now if we go back to 2 Timothy again. And I know I'm back and forth here a little bit. But I want to look at this here a little bit. 
2 Timothy chapter 3. We were in chapter 2, and I'm going to go to chapter 3. And I want to consider the word in, in 2 Timothy 3.17. And uh, the word perfect. I want to consider this a little bit. And what do we understand by this word? Uh, I really have had conversations with different people. Uh, I have lots of family that go to a church where they say that slowly you become perfect. You can become perfect even in this body. Uh, you, you don't sin anymore. And the, actually the, one of the churches here in Almer teaches this. You can become perfect. So I kind of want to look at that in uh, 2 Timothy 3.17. And because I've had uh, conversations about this, uh, 3.17, let's read that. It says, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So what does 2 Timothy 3.17 does this mean sinless, perfect, sinlessly perfect? Is God telling us to be sinlessly perfect here? Is he telling us this? How do we interpret this? Because there are so many that will say, yes, we are supposed to be sinlessly perfect. Now let's think about that. Are we sinlessly perfect? I don't think we are. I don't think we are. I do believe we do sometimes sin. We shouldn't sin. I agree with that 100%, but I believe sometimes we do. We do not come to be, we do not get to a perfect, to be perfect in this body. So what does this verse mean? Well, the rest of the verse actually explains it. And you know, and this is one of the verses one of my uncles showed me, and that's where I wanted to go there. He said, just go to 2 Timothy. It says that the man of God may be perfect. And God wouldn't say that if he couldn't be perfect. So that means we are perfect. God doesn't count it anymore imperfect if we do something wrong. It's not counted as sin anymore, he said, because now we're perfect in Christ. Uh, you know something? One day I know I'll be perfect when I have my glorified body. Amen? a body that does not get sick, does not get tired, and then I know I will be perfect. So what do we do here with this word? Does this mean sinlessly perfect? No. The word is defined in the rest of the verse. It means thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It means perfect in the sense of fully equipped to do God's will. So we are supposed to be perfect in a sense. We are supposed to be fully equipped to do God's work. But we won't be sinlessly perfect as long as we are in this body. So the same verse again. The context, if it rules, teaches us what this means, how we can interpret it. And I think that's so important. And yes, and then there's the some would say, apparent contradiction between James and Romans about salvation, about, and I, I'd like to go there, but I think today I probably won't go much longer. Uh, but yeah, let's go to the book of Romans here a bit. Book of Romans, I'm going to go to chapter 3, and I'm also going to go to the book of James, now I want to read some verses here. And there seems to be an apparent contradiction between James 2, 24, and Romans 3, 24, and 4, 5. Now let's go to the book of James and read that. And uh, yet we know the Bible doesn't contradict itself, does it? So we need to see what does this mean? Why does it seem like it's contradicting itself? Let's go to the book of James, chapter 2, and I'm going to read verse 24. It says, You see then how that by works a man is justified, 
and not by faith only. That's what James says here. So how by, it says here, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now let's go to Romans. Let's go to the book of Romans, see what Paul says. In chapter 3, verse 24, the book of Romans. It says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, here we see ju we're justifying, justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Not by works, but by grace. And yet, people have said, okay, why does James say then that by works? You see then how that by works a man is justified. And this is something, let's go to Romans 4, chapter 4. And I'm going to read verse 5 there as well. It says, but to him that worketh, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Yet there's no contradiction. So how do we do this? How do we explain this to the people? The apparent contradiction between James and Paul disappears when we consider the context. Paul, on one hand, was addressing the subject of salvation. Paul was addressing the subject of salvation. You can be saved through grace. You're justified by grace through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's the teaching of Paul all the time. And that's what Paul was doing here. Paul, on one hand, was addressing the subject of salvation, of how a lost man can be made right with God, and he tells us that the sinner must trust exclusively in the grace of Jesus Christ for salvation. James, on the other hand, is addressing the subject of Christian service. So there's a big difference here. Paul is addressing salvation, and James is addressing the Christian service. The Christian service. And this is where the contradiction goes away, where it goes away of how James was addressing the subject of Christian service, of how a saved man can please God in this life. He tells us that true faith is evident by works. There is no contradiction if one considers the context of each statement. And that's so important for us to understand. I've told people this sometimes. And I thank God for the material he's given me to study. But sometimes God talks to saved people. And sometimes God talks to unsaved people in the Bible. And he can't talk to the saved people the same as the unsaved. And then sometimes he talks to the obedient, the ones that are saved and are obedient. And sometimes he talks to the ones that are saved and are not obe obedient. So yet again, he has to talk differently. So we need to know, we need to look at the context before we see, say there's any contradiction between the two. And yes, between Romans and James, there's no contradiction whatsoever. Paul is addressing the unsaved sinner's per perspective. The sinner must trust Jesus Christ exclusively for salvation. He must reject his own filthy works, as Isaiah 64, 6 teaches us, and all self-righteousness, as Romans 9 teaches us, and lean totally upon the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting wholly in his perfect and complete redemption. James, on the other hand, is addressing the Christian's perspective. The Christian claims to have faith in Jesus Christ. He is therefore to diligently serve God at all times. We are supposed to have good works after salvation, not for salvation. We need to walk in the Lord's commandments, James is telling us. Those who live in rebellion, who ignore the word of God, demonstrate that they do not possess true saving faith. That is what James is teaching, and Paul is teaching how to be saved. So yes, there's a lot of different, and I wanted to look at some, this here today just a little bit. I believe there's a lot of different ways of interpre interpreting the Bible, but I believe the first is 
Contacts is all important. It's all important. We need to allow the contacts to rule at all times. Second, we need to also, and I'm not going to go into that today, but we need to compare scripture with scripture. We need to compare scripture with scripture. And yes, clear passages must interpret the less clear as well. So we could look into so many things. And uh, we'll get into something, some more of that, the Lord willing, a little later. But I think interpreting the Bible correctly is very important. And there's a lot of tools we have. There's a lot of books written on this and that we can study this. How do we interpret the Bible correctly? So we understand exactly what God is saying. And that is, let the context rule. What we've seen today. Just let the context rule at all times so God can talk to us and show us exactly what each and every context is teaching. 